though, this week's Parsha reading is a combination of two readings, Bihar, and that means on the mountain, and Bechukotai, uh, which means in my statutes. And uh, we'll be mainly in chapter 25. Chapter 25 revolves around the topic of the land. He lays down the laws of the Sabbath year and the laws of the Jubilee year. On Yom Kippur of each 50th year, you shall proclaim liberty in the land to all of its inhabitants. Now, it deals with the use and ownership of the land. The rights and obligations of landowners and buying and selling the land. Now, here is the basic rule. The basic rule concerning the land is laid down in chapter 25 and verse 22. The land is mine, God says. (laughs) The land is mine. And you are aliens and tenants with me. Now, the world is rushing to disaster because the nations don't understand this concept of ownership. Who owns the land? God does by virtue of the truth that he created the land. He created the land. It belongs to him. He is the owner. And we may own a house. We may own the land. But in our ownership, we are tenants. Now, what ground do we have to pray for the Lord to send forth his guardian angels to protect our land? Have you ever thought about that? Well, the very ground that you pray on, God owns it, even though it is recorded in your name. Now, as far as Israel... A two-state solution is no solution because God owns the land and has specifically given it to Israel. Now, every time Israel gives up land, it will result in trouble because they don't have the right to give up what God has ordained they have. It results in trouble for Israel and disaster for the nations. One day, the forces of the United Nations will march on Jerusalem and our Messiah will return and breathe on them. I won't tell you what I almost wrote. But one day Yeshua will return and breathe on them. Poof. Set up his temple and rule over all of the nations. See, all of this turmoil will happen in the end times simply because we don't understand the huge issue of ownership. Now, I hope you grasp the importance of what I'm saying this morning. And and so, chapter 25 revolves around this topic of the land. It lays down in the laws, uh, the laws for the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year on Yom Kippur, as we have said. You shall proclaim. You shall proclaim. 
a 50th year, and you shall proclaim liberty in all of the land to all of its inhabitants. Now, it deals with this whole ownership issue. And then the land shall keep a Sabbath to Adonai. The Sabbath is not only given to man, but it is also given to the land. How important is this? This is profoundly important. The Sabbath is not only given to man, but it's also given to the land. Even the land is to keep the Sabbath. At the end of days, I believe that we will know the full importance of this special day. The Sabbath has popped up more than 25 times in its different aspects so far in Torah. And, and now there is a seven-year cycle. The farmer also had a year off from uh, many of his responsibilities. All of the food that was produced was to be used for feeding the family and workers on the farm. The question actually comes up whether or not to let our producing land lay fallow every seventh year. Now, these laws are land dependent. They are not expected today. However, our land is overworked and depleted of its broad range of minerals. And even though these commands are land dependent, there are principles to guide our living in our land. Twice it says it shall be a year of rest to the land, a Sabbath to Adonai. Since it says that the land is Adonai's, and Israel was a nation of tenants with Adonai, we understand that God owned the land. It was a gift from Adonai. Not only was the land belonging to Adonai, but the produce belonged to him as well. So the wave offerings in the spring dedicated the harvest to God and the thanksgiving offerings in the fall thanked him for the harvest. The principle is that our provisions come from the Lord. Do we understand that? Our provisions come from the Lord. He owns it all and his provision is a gift from him. You see, many of us don't really understand the whole issue of ownership. We understand perhaps more the, the issue of thanksgiving, but many of us struggle with ownership. If jobs are difficult to come by, then we need to look more deeply into this issue of ownership. Uh, our jobs are as uh, much a spiritual matter as they are a physical matter. Uh, Psalm 37, 25 says, I have been young and am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Uh, the overall principle is we're not forsaken. God himself is involved in our provisions. Now, I personally believe that this is one of the aspects of the fear of God. It all belongs to him, and we are dependent on him. We're not entitled to it. We're not deserving of it. We have to put forth the effort to work. Work has, uh, was blessed before the fall of Adam. Work existed in the blameless state of Adam and Eve 
when they were first created. Work is a blessing. Now, I like God's view of work. Six days you are to work, the seventh day you are to rest. Isn't that simple? Six years the land is to be cultivated, the seventh year is to be rest. You see, the Sabbath rest is important and is a very simple to understand. Our problems are the problems we make through taking a half-hearted attitude concerning Shabbat rest. Uh, there was one verse that drew my attention in this uh, first chapter. And when you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year for lo?" We may not sow nor gather our increase. Then I have commanded. Remember that uh, this verse is, doesn't say I will command. It says I have commanded my blessing on you in the sixth year. You just follow what I tell you to do, and I have commanded the blessing already. For the sixth year, and it shall produce the increase for three years. You shall sow the eighth year and shall eat of the old crop until the ninth year, until the coming in of its crop. You shall eat of the old. Now, what does that mean? It means that God can bless you anytime He wants to. At any time, He can add more than you need. And in the sixth year, God commanded his blessing. You follow the ways of God, and God commands his blessing. It's so simple. Many want to do it their way and expect God to bless. When God doesn't bless, we belly ache and we complain. See, God is the one who commands the blessing. Every six year, every person in Israel needed to trust the Lord big time for his provision. It was a constant reminder that God owns the land and we are tenants alongside of him and the produce of the land is his blessing. We don't see blessing in our finances because God hasn't commanded the blessing. Whether we receive money for work or not, we are to work. We look around for work to do because work is blessed. And God will pay us in different ways. Uh, one way to work is when you don't have work is to study Scripture. <laughs> this is possibly the greatest work of all. Another area of work is volunteering in the community. Uh, Proverbs uh, 8 uh, says, Riches and honor are with me. Uh, you catch the literal there? Riches and honor are with me, God says, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold. My increase is better than the best silver. I walk in the path of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice to cause those who love me to inherit wealth. I will fill up their treasuries. And this is in the Tanakh. You say, to those who love me, I will cause to inherit wealth. Now, the wealth God gives has his blessing on them. Mm -hmm. The truth is, God is over this, all over this issue of wealth. Mm -hmm. 
I, I don't expect everybody to be wealthy. I, I do expect us all to walk in God's ways. I don't believe that it is a sin not to have a job, but we are falling short when we don't work. In our day and time, jobs can be very difficult to find. And at times, we find ourselves out of a job, but our jobs are in his hands. The success of our jobs are in his hands. And since uh, our jobs are in his hands, we can learn during those times when we are out of a job. Uh, there is a lesson here to learn. Seek the Lord to find out what he's saying because he is vitally involved in your provision. Now, Psalm 49, uh, 6 gives us a warning. Those who trust in their wealth <laughs> and in their riches boast themselves. Uh, I, I just a way of saying is proud. You trust in your wealth and in your riches, you're proud. You're making a boast that doesn't include the Lord. Trusting in our jobs or in accumulations of wealth is a sure way to fall. Because what it is saying to God is, I'm proud of what I have and I'm proud of what I do. And we all know that pride leads to a fall. Uh, actually, the whole issue is a matter of faith and trusting in God. The more we throw ourselves upon him, the safer we are. And, and, and so I ask you to relax. Relax. Don't get so up, uptight and, and, and trust him. It's in his hands anyway. He can adjust the outgoing money as well as adjusting the incoming money. Paul founded a number of congregations in his three missionary journeys. He would lay out the halakha for the congregations that covered a lot of different situations. For example, he says in 2 Thessalonians, For even when we were with you, we commanded this to you, if anyone does not desire to work, neither let him eat. If you don't want to work, go hungry. But we hear some are walking in a disorderly way among you. We're not working at all, but being busybodies. And we command such and exhort through our Lord Messiah Yeshua, working with quietness, they may eat their own bread. And, and, and so we have these... <laughs> You think I'm directly to the point. That's pretty, that's pretty direct, isn't it? And, and, and so we, we understand uh, some of the things in which Paul set up as halakha for the congregations. That work is blessed. It is good. So go out and find a job. Uh, the other consideration in gaining wealth is stewardship. Although each of us have different amounts of wealth, we are all called to a life of stewardship because we are held accountable for what God allows us to have. We have spoken on this issue of wealth many times. The sages say that the more property and possessions a person acquires, the more worry and concern he acquires. And, and I, I believe that our Lord teaches us to live simply, even though our homes all look different, and that's good. And that's good. Rejoice in what God has given to you. 
But the real issue is that of ownership and stewardship. And, and so it's within these two issues the blessing is commanded. It is at this point that I'd like to push uh, the issue of tithing. Uh, tithing has to do with ownership and stewardship. We, we naturally want to come up with all kinds of reasons why we don't have to pay the tithe on net income or that the tithe isn't commanded in the New Testament. It doesn't have to be commanded in the New Testament. Now, that whole line of thinking came out of false doctrine taught in the mid-1800s. For example, the Sabbath isn't directly commanded in the New Testament, but it is found boldly in the teachings of Yeshua and in the actions of Paul. Yeshua says, the Son of Man is Lord over Shabbat. You got that right. You see, unless God changes the day, we can't. And God didn't. This gives some excuses to change the day to another day, something that ironically is never changed by the one who hallowed the seventh day to begin with. Uh, we have so many mentions of the tithe, even going back to Genesis, where it's known where it was a known practice. Abraham paid the tithe to Melchizedek, as well as Jacob vowed a tithe of all of his property to God. In Deuteronomy, it says, after you have tithed your tithes, then you shall say before Adonai your God, I have brought away the holy things out of my house. And I've given it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the fatherless, and to the widow, according to all of your commandments, Lord, which you have commanded me. I have not broken your commandments, neither have I forgotten. Now, this verse t uh, simply tells us that the tithe is already separated unto God before you separate it unto God. Uh, the, the, what God is saying is you have to get it out of your house because it's hallowed. It's holy. It's separated to God. And now you have to get it out of your house. It's important you get it out of your house. For there is a price to pay, all because we don't understand the issues of ownership and stewardship. Well, the Proverbs also say, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to a man who lends. He who sows injustice will reap evil, and the rod of his wrath shall fail. He who has a good eye, as opposed to an evil eye, he is blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Now, these Proverbs reflect our Torah portion as do many other scriptures. The rich rule over the poor, so the uh, Torah provides safeguards for that reality. The borrower is servant of the lender, so the Torah provides a means of release and redemption from that situation. He who sows injustice will reap evil, so the Torah lays down rules against injustice. He who has a good eye, he is blessed, for he gives his bread to the poor. And the Torah commands the support for the priest, for the poor, for the widow, often, and the strangers among us. And so we ask the question, how does this affect us? We need to work out our plan to get out of debt. We loan without charging interest. We are generous to the poor. We grow to trust Him more. Even more do we grow in our trust in Him 
when it comes to our finances. And, and, and so it's not sinful to, be, sinful to be poor, for it says, so he can live with you. Those of us who might qualify for that are certainly valued members in the community. And, of course, Jacob, alias James, in, his second, uh, in the se- second chapter of his letter says, if a rich man comes in and you treat him differently than a poor man who comes in after him, you sin. You sin. Because they both have value to me. So therefore, they need to have value to you. And, and, and so it's not sinful to be on the poor side. Been there all my life. Well, not all my life, but I've been there for the last 50 years. Being wealthy or having more than we need certainly has its heavy loads and temptations. And I would like to close uh, this morning, and you're saying, whew, that time. By looking at key principles that are listed in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, chapters 7, 8, and 9 are the full mention of finances or the full mention of wealth in the scriptures. There's a first mention and there's a full mention. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says, But I say this, He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Just like agricultural principles, the more you sow, the more you reap. Well, the more you give, the more you receive. basic principle that all of Scripture will say amen to. The next verse, each one, as he purposes in his heart, let him give, not of grief or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You see, giving is a honor. A giving is a privilege. Giving is a blessing, and you need to do it with a cheerful heart. That's a tough one. Because we don't understand, and this is the most difficult one for me, because I, I, I normally, I just, you know, my emotional state is like an arrow, straight to the point. It's hard for me to get, particularly about giving. And yet God requires us. God encourages us to do it with a cheerful heart. And here we have in verse 8, the all verse of Scripture. This is the all verse of Scripture. I encourage you to memorize it. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that in everything, always having all sufficiency, You may abound to every good work. God is able. God will come through. God loves you with an everlasting love. But he simply wants you to obey him. You know? He simply wants our obedience. In the next verse, as it is written, he scattered, he has given to the poor. Now, now watch this. His righteousness remains forever. You want to leave something behind? His righteousness remains forever. This is a righteous thing to do. And God will bless it big time. 
The next verse, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for eating, may he supply, multiply your seed and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Paul's pronouncing a blessing over the congregation at Corinth. In the next verse, you being enriched in everything to all generosity, which works out thanksgiving to God through us. God gets the glory when He's in charge. <laughs> he's in charge anyway, you may as well. You see, you see it works out to, to His praise. It works out to His glory. Now, God's economics are not our economics. We have to understand that from this chapter and from these two partial readings today. God's economics are not our economics. These things just don't happen in the world. They really don't. But God's people were called to be different, and when they obeyed, they prospered, and when they refused to obey the laws of the seventh year, they lost the land, and they would go into captivity as a result of not understanding ownership and stewardship. A, a lot is on the line, but it all boils down to understanding who owns it? And what are my responsibilities? In those things that God gives to us. 